Hello! Today we will discuss the vertebral column kinematics. Here are some familiar movements to all of us. Flexion, extension, side bending, and rotation. But did you ever wonder what part of the spinal column is responsible for the majority of rotation in the body? What part of the spine allows you to bend all the way forward to touch your toes? At which spinal segment do these movements truly originate? Well, let's answer these questions now. Okay. There are three main factors influencing the mobility of the spine. The first one is the joint angulation. It is the main contributing factor to the movement of the vertebrae. The plane of the facet joints within each vertebral segment influences the kinematics at that specific region of the vertebral column. For instance, the orientation of the superior facets of the second cervical vertebrae at 20 degrees of the transverse plane allows for a large range of rotation in the cervical spine and the sagittal plane orientation of lumbar facets allows for more flexion extension movements. Okay, the next factor is the size of the intervertebral disc, or specifically the ratio of the size of the disc to the size of the vertebrae. And finally, the last factor is the local muscle action, of course, bony and ligamentous attachments. Okay, let's take a look at the vertebral column itself. It consists of 33 vertebral segments divided into 5 regions. There are 7 cervical, 12 thoracic, 5 lumbar, 5 sacral, and 4 coccygeal segments. The combination of these regional movements creates the full range of motion in the body, but each individual segment has been crafted for a specific movement. So let's take a closer look at the individual regions. This chart gives us a great deal of information about spinal mobility. It is divided into three rows, which mark the three regions of the spine, cervical, thoracic, and lumbar, and three columns, which mark the movement at the regions, flexion, extension, rotation, and side bending. Let's start with the cervical spine and find out which motion predominates in that region. Cervical vertebrae are the smallest, yet the most mobile out of all the vertebrae. The high degree of mobility is essential to the large range of motion required by the head. Cervical flexion range of motion on average is 50 degrees, while extension is 80 degrees. The full range of rotation is about 80 to each side, and finally there is about 40 degrees of side bending available throughout the cervical spine. So both extension and rotation predominate in the cervical spine. Let's dive into more detail. About 25% of the total sagittal range of motion occurs at the upper two cervical segments, and 75% occurs throughout the lower cervical spine. The segments that stand out specifically in the lower cervical spine are the C5-C6 segments. If you're a practicing therapist, you will know that the large amount of patients with neck pain are referred specifically for a herniation at C5-C6 level. So perhaps there is a relationship between the mobility of a joint and injury prevalence. Okay, next is rotation. The first bar stands out the most. It's C1, C2 with a relatively large amount of rotation. As a matter of fact, studies have shown that the upper cervical spine is responsible for 50% of the total neck rotation. So, amongst the cases where C1, C2 becomes arthritic, we observe a drastic loss of rotation range of motion. Okay, and finally, side bending. Only about 5 degrees occur at the atlanto-occipital region, which accounts for about 12% contribution to the total side bending range of motion. Most of the movement actually occurs at C2 through C7 regions, with about 88% of the total contribution. Now, let's take a look at the thoracic range of motion. There is about 40 degrees of flexion and 20 degrees of extension available at the thoracic region. There's about 30 degrees of total rotation and about 30 degrees of side bending range of motion. So thoracic flexion range of motion certainly predominates this region. What stands out in the sagittal plane is that as we move down the spine, we notice an increase in flexion and extension. This is actually secondary to a change in the orientation of the articular structure. The joint orientation changes from the frontal plane to the sagittal plane, thus adding the degrees to flexion and extension movements. Rotation in the thoracic spine is unfortunately not very eventful, so uh, with even contribution from each one of the segments. And finally, side bending. Even though the segments themselves are mobile, the movement is being restricted by the thoracic ribcage. 
we're giving up the mobility for the vital organ protection, which makes sense. What you also observe is that there is a slight increase in the mobility as we move down the spine, which is actually secondary to the lower ribs being the floaters, thus minimizing the barrier to movement. Okay, now we move on to lumbar range of motion. Lumbar spine possesses about 55 degrees of flexion and 25 degrees of extension. Only 5 degrees of rotation and 20 degrees of side bending. Clearly here flexion is a predominant moment. And there is a reason for that. Lumbar segments are predominantly oriented in the sagittal plane. Secondary to this anatomical architecture, we notice more flexion and extension motion, which allows the spine to be the main pivot point of the entire trunk. Okay, now you know which part of the spine possesses most range of motion in each of the cardinal planes. Now that you've learned these concepts, there are a million ways to apply it. Whether you're a physical therapist looking to find the hypermobile or irritable areas in your patients, or you're a dancer looking to increase the mobility of your spine. Now you know the anatomical architecture and the biomechanical principles that guide the movement.